bit of anxiety. But you never doubted your singing ability? Not my singing ability. I doubted my acting ability. And that's where the great Moss Hart, who was the director of my fair lady, was the kindest, most gentle giant anybody could ask for. And he and Alan J. Lennon and Frederick Lowe, well, I did walk with gentle giants in those days, and they couldn't have been kinder. I had a feeling that any second I would be sent home, because the role of Eliza, who was all, in case anybody wants to see it, is playing, I think, at the uh, Armisen. Um, the role of Eliza is killing, I, you know, eight performances a week, and uh, you are screaming, cockney, yelling, angry, doing George Bernard Shaw, and singing rage-filled songs, and they're pure soprano songs, and it, it takes its toll, and it did. How did you feel, well, you pioneered the singing role of Eliza, that had been done on stage? Um, explain that one more time. The, the singing role of Eliza, you were the first to do the music. Yes. Yeah. How does it feel seeing so many subsequent interpreters? Of oh, this it, it's wonderful. First of all, it's uh, without any um, shame. I say I think it's one of the great, great musicals that's ever been on Broadway. It was the great golden era of Broadway, and I was lucky enough to be asked to be in it. So, um, having originated the role on Broadway, um, it's just wonderful to keep seeing it being done and redone, and each time it's magical. Each time. It stands up, which means that the craft beneath it, the, the uh, technique of making that musical was superb. And once you moved from the boyfriend to My Fair Lady and it became an extraordinary a nuclear sort of hit, how did your family deal with ah. this? Your family that was Marvillian, they were used to the stage, but this was stage. Well, with, once the, the boyfriend was through and I went back home for a brief month or so, after the boyfriend, before coming back from my fair lady to New York. And then that salary did allow for my parents to come on over. And of course, I'm, from time to time, they did come. And uh, it was wonderful to be able to spoil them and, and show my mom a good time and uh, my father a good time. My parents were divorced, as you obviously gathered, and uh, so we were two families that one had to. But your mother wasn't exactly effusive about She wasn't. I think she, too, was a little overwhelmed by, perhaps overwhelmed a bit by this daughter that surprised her, by being in such a great, great show, and then Broadway itself, and then all that was going on around her. And my guess, as I write in the book, is that what she left behind at home was a worry to her. She, with her husband, and she left two kids at home, and my stepbrothers, and uh, so she probably was more exhausted and overwhelmed than thrilled at seeing me on Broadway. That's my guess. And, and how did you, you adapt to it so well? It seems. How did the rest of your family deal with this? You had an ocean in between you, and your name was renowned here. Well, certainly in, in, in New York it was. Um, but but um, the fa my father, who was a um, wonderful correspondent, wrote marvelous um, letters and, and just the kind of letters that I like to get, like the blossom is out now and uh, we uh, culled some fresh garden peas and had them for lunch with the man today and uh, all the good things that one wants to hear and the blossoms out and uh, um, things like that that I like to do. A Broadway cast, I suppose, ends up being like a family. It does. It does. really so does. And it's a terrible blow when one of the cast leaves. Um, a long run is a very cruel... I did Fair Lady on Broadway for two years, and then I did it for 18 months in London. And you are constantly, on any day, you are shifting and changing depending on whether your leading man has a headache or a cold or he's off, or other members of the company are out for some reason, or it's a blizzard outside, or it's so hot that the air conditioning fails, and uh, there's all those other things to think about besides presenting it. First class. Well, you write about the character that the, the uh, other actors you perform with, with the, you have an intimacy that even sometimes I would think marriage in some ways would replicate. And Rex Harrison had him on there with these certain digestive issues. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> I know exactly where you're going to. Um, I'll leave it to you to say the word. Exactly. Um, he was a uh, Rex at times could be what we refer to as being a very windy gentleman. <laughs> uh, occasionally would you know let fly on stage and it was
this a little disconcerting. <laughs> the first time he did it, uh, we were doing a scene at the end of My Fair Lady, and I write about it in the book, and uh, uh, we were doing a scene at the end of My Fair Lady, and it's the scene where Eliza has run from his house to his mother's house, and she is telling his mother uh, the difference between a lady and a gutter snipe <laughs> is not how she behaves, but how she is treated. And uh, Henry Higgins shows up, and all Rex had to do was pace up and down at the back of the stage in a kind of fury that I was getting my comeuppance in a way and saying what it was to be a true lady. And I had just finished my speech about being a lady when Rex let fly with a, <laughs> uh, as I describe in the book, a machine gun bomb. <laughs> Very well, but I got it well enough to at least fool a number 